Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to introduce our speaker this morning. And to get everything right, I'm going to read from some notes. Uh, we are privileged to have Dr. John Cassani, who retired from JPL in 2012 join us this morning to be our speaker. He's been a leader in the development and management of spacecraft systems for more than 50 years. And he uh, ended as chief engineer of Caltech's Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, in 2009. He led design teams for both the Ranger and Mariner spacecraft designs. He held senior project positions in many of the Mariner missions to Mars and Venus, and was project manager for three major space missions at JPL, Voyager, Galileo, and Cassini. After stepping down as chief engineer in 1999, Dr. Cassani served in several nationally prominent committees, including leading the investigation boards of both the Mars Climate Orbiter and the Mars Polar Lander failures, and as the technical consultant to the NASA Mars Program Independent Assessment Team, which laid the basis for a revised and vigorous Mars Exploration Initiative. From early 2003 through 2005, Dr. Kasani served as the project manager for NASA's Prometheus project and the Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter mission, which was slated to be the nation's first nuclear-powered electric propulsion spacecraft. From 2005 until his retirement in 2012, Kasani has been manager of the Institutional Special Projects Office at JPL. He's the recipient of several NASA awards, including the Distinguished Service Medal, the Exceptional Achievement Medal, and the Medal for Outstanding Leadership. And he was also, in 2009, awarded the Air and Space Museum Trophy for Lifetime Achievement and the National Academy of Engineering Founders Award. So it is my uh, pleasure and privilege to welcome Dr. Masani. There you go. There you go. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. So it's a real pleasure to be here, everyone. Good morning, and uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, did you have a Full house, that means that bacon's almost gone, I suppose. <laughs> uh, I want to tell you a little something. I was born and raised in Philadelphia and came out here in 1956 after having worked a, a year in upstate New York. And uh, there's one person I remember so much from my arrival here. It was the first thing I did was buy a car, and then the second thing you do after you buy a car is buy an insurance. And that's how I met Don Melvin. So he was the first person. I've known him longer than anybody else in this room. And for that, I want you to cut me a lot of slack. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, um, let's see, that. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about JPL and where we fit into NASA. A lot of people, you know, I ask that question. Uh, NASA was created uh, by the Space Act in 19, I think it was 58. Uh, JPL, prior to that time, worked for the Army. We were developing guided missiles for the Army. And I started at JPL in 1956, so NASA had not yet formed. Uh, at that time, uh, there was an old NACA, the National Advisory Committee or Council for Aviation or something. And they had three centers. They had one in Langley, Virginia, one in California, uh, the Ames Research Center, and uh, another one in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. The one in Langley and and uh, Ames uh, worked on airfoils and vacuum uh, wind tunnels and that sort of thing. One in, in Cleveland uh, worked on air engines and so forth. So when NASA was formed, uh, the uh, NACA was really transformed into what became the new NASA. And those were the three centers that formed NASA at that time. JPL was uh, transferred from the Army to the new organization called NASA. And then quickly thereafter, there were a number of other centers formed. Uh, Dryden was there already, but then there's JPL in California, the Johnson Space Center outside of Houston, mainly dealing with astronauts and, and uh, human exploration. Space, uh, Stena Space Center is a major test facility. Marshall develops uh, rocket engine propulsion uh, mainly and, uh, and large space structures. Kennedy was the old uh, Patrick Air Force Base uh, launch station. Uh, had NASA headquarters is in Washington, D.C., the Langley's in Virginia, and the Goddard Space Flight Center is in uh, Maryland. And they build mainly uh, Earth-oriented uh, uh, missions. JPL is mainly uh, deep space-oriented missions, and almost everything else in NASA has to do with human exploration. So that's... So um, this is a budget card. This is a history of the budget. Can you see am I in the way? Um, 
Yeah, so the funding started in 58. This is a, the Apollo error here. Peak funding, these are in 19, uh, 2013 dollars, but in, in this year, which was uh, 1968 or 66, the peak funding in real year dollars was about, I think, eight or nine million dollars, and this has just been inflated for 2013 to sort of make the budget relevant in terms of buying power. During the space shuttle era, the uh, funding was pretty but constant, and since then, the space station era, it's, it's leveled out, hardly moved at all. This is the same chart that's expressed not in terms of dollars, but in terms of percentage of the federal budget. So the peak was about 4.4%, and uh, now it's down to uh, less than 0.4%. Uh, and uh, that's where it is today. This is uh, how that NASA budget, NASA budget in, um, in, this, in 17 was just almost no $19 million, and this is how it's, it's split up. Most of it goes for human exploration, 44% of the total budget. Robotic exploration, which includes all the spacecraft that the JPL has been and, and Goddard deal with, uh, satellites, Earth orbits, or deep space missions, uh, about 30%. So the ratio of these two is about two to one. That ratio has been constant for the whole history of NASA. Um, the op cost for operating all those 10 facilities that I talked about is, is there. Uh, aeronautics, which, was, which is what the A in NASA stands for, is, not very large, as you can see, but this mainly is what the old NAC I used to do, I think, and then there's some technology money. Um, this is, there we go. So um, now we're just looking at the robotic part of the budget. And uh, the labels on here got mixed up, but this is, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Earth, ex uh, Earth exploration. Uh, ex satellites for communications, for weather, for, um, monitoring uh, climate change and what have you. That's the bulk of the, of the robotic exploration budget. This is planetary. This is where things like the Mariner flybys, Voyager, Jupiter orbiters, all the Mars rovers, uh, the Cassini mission is all part of the planetary program. Astrophysics, this would be the Hubble telescope and the JST Hubble t t telescope and a bunch of other uh, uh, missions that are directed toward stars and the galaxies and things outside of our own solar system. And uh, these are some other things that I won't mention. So that's the background. Now, this part of the presentation is the bulk of what I want to talk about, and I call it the golden age of exploration. There's uh, the space error can be thought of, in two, uh, the, or the space exploration can be thought of in two, three errors. One error is just learning how to do it, which is what we were doing with the early Mariner and Ranger programs. Uh, just learning how to build space or get stuff, uh, build stuff that would work in space. Then the next phase, which is sort of we're at the end of now, is uh, learning what's out there. First, learning how to get there and spend time there. The next error is uh, learning what's out there. And, uh, that error was kicked off of the Voyager program. Voyager really opened up for us what the solar system is all about. And the next error, which we'll be starting off, uh, hopefully soon, will be bringing material back. And we've gotten a little bit of a head start on that. So astrophysics, uh, this is a, a, an amazing photograph as far as I'm concerned. What you see there are five galaxies. This is one, they're all in the same frame here. Uh, they're interacting, interacting in the sense that the gravitational field of one galaxy is influence the behavior and the motion of the adjoining galaxy. So there's five, there's one, one uh, two galaxies here, and three, four, five interacting, amazing. Uh, this is a picture of our, the, the planets in our solar system. They're arranged in their order from the Sun. Here's Mercury, there's Venus, Earth, Mars, there's Jupiter, there's Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and out here somewhere you can barely see Pluto, which has been demoted uh, in the last few years. It's no longer officially a planet, it's a minor planet or some other label like that. And the reason for that is that that change was that these uh, eight planets all formed in a similar way out of the debris cloud that was, you know, part of our, part of the sun's environment early on. But they think that uh, Pluto now was captured from some object out, further out in the Oort, Oort cloud and came in. Most of these uh, planets move in almost circular orbits. Uh, Pluto is a very highly elliptical order. It's, uh, well, I just mentioned their distance. Uh, okay, this is uh, where Earth is. And, a convenient yardstick used by astronomers to measure distances in the solar system is the 
average distance that the Earth is from the Sun, and that's about 93 million miles, but they call that one AU, that's a good yardstick. So Mercury's here at four tenths of an AU, Saturn's at seven tenths, Earth's at one, Mars is 1.4, Jupiter is out at five AU. So it's five times further from the Sun than the Earth. If you're operating on solar panels, uh, the, the, the intensity goes down over the square of the distance, so we go five times further from the Sun, you're 25 times down in, in, the, in solar energy. Uh, which makes uh, make, makes for very, very large solar panels, which we weren't able to do until just recently. Saturn is 10 times, which means you've got one one hundredth of the solar energy there. And then uh, Uranus and Neptune, that's, this is 10, 20, 30, and Pluto is more or less 40. Pluto, sometimes in its orbit, comes inside the orbit of Neptune. If the Sun was in this picture, the Sun, the Earth, the Earth, the Jupiter is about 10 times larger in diameter than the Earth. If the Sun was in this picture, it would be 10 times larger in diameter than, than Jupiter. So if you can imagine that this is to scale this up to, to be the size of the Sun, then Jupiter would be the size of the Earth, and the Earth would be very, barely visible at that scale. As a matter of fact, uh, Carl Sagan used to describe the solar system as consisting of three bodies, the Sun, two, two planets, and a lot of debris. The Earth is part of that debris. So now, one of those planets is pretty friendly to life. It's the one we live on, and a lot of what um, NASA is all about is studying uh, that. Uh, if, if you go back, um, the Earth was formed about 4.3 or 4.4 billion years ago. Life started to evolve, really, within the first 200,000 million years, or very quickly after the formation. And uh, it evolved uh, 3.8 billion years later, uh, we have all this uh, amazing diversity of life, and evolution continues. And if you sort of bring it up to the very present, you even find people like yourselves, you know, are on that evolutionary chain, and you represent the best that the Earth has got to offer. So think about that in terms of whether this is a planet worth saving. <laughs> okay, so this is the JPL business base. JPL uh, uh, last year had a, a, a total of about $1.8 billion and it's divided up into planetary uh, astronomy and a bunch of other things. The planetary program is, con is uh, represented here. This is everything but Mars, and this is Mars. So you can see most of the money that's being spent in the planetary program is on Mars, and I'll sh show you a little bit about that later. Um, this is the Earth, uh, what's, this is how much we spend at JPL on Earth research, Earth science. Um, that up there is, uh, uh, astrophysics, and then we have, um, uh, what's the next one here? Whoop, I, I went too far, went too far. Uh, there, this is the Earth, and uh, this is, uh, as, this, look, this is um, uh, astrophysics and stuff like that, and this here is, uh, this here is the reimbursable. Reimbursable work is work that JPL does for other centers, other than, other agencies, other than NASA. And uh, most of this is uh, classified work. So uh, this is a little movie uh, which, which uh, depicts four days in the life of a Cassini spacecraft, which uh, started um, uh, a number of years ago. I think we launched it in 1998. Uh, a day on Saturn is only about 10 hours, 10 and a half hours. So Saturn rotates pretty quickly. Uh, the next video that will be showing, this will show the rotation of uh, Saturn. Uh, and you can see that circle is tracking a storm. You might not have been able to see it, but uh, uh, it's oval shaped. There's the shadow of Saturn on the, uh, on the rings. Uh, then the, the innermost ring is very, very faint, but uh, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ring material out there. This is a shadow of the rings on Saturn. And up here is a very interesting hexagonal uh, shaped cloud structure. It's almost a perfect hexagon. It rotates with Jupiter ten, once every 10 hours. It does not seem to distort or uh, what have you. And scale-wise, uh, there is the size of the Earth compared to one side of that hexagon. And it's amazing. I don't think the people yet have figured out what, uh, uh, why that hexagonal shape uh, the, develops and maintains itself. So we're coming to the end of uh, the Cassini lifetime, and in order to uh, honor the uh, treaty for uh, uh, 
not contaminating any places which could be a boat for life, uh, we have to dispose of that spacecraft to make sure that in the future it doesn't crash onto one of the moons of, uh, of Saturn. And the way we're going to do that is we're changing the orbit from what happened. Uh, Oh, did I miss that whole thing? No. Okay, that's a storm system in Jupiter's atmosphere. Um, that's the scale of that. That's about two Earths would fit inside of that storm system. So it's huge. It's sort of like the great red spot on Jupiter, which is even bigger than this. Oh, here's the, here we go. So the orbit of uh, Cassini was changed from one which always stayed outside of the rings of Saturn to one that we're going to go to send the space where we've already done it once in between the innermost ring and the surface of, uh, of Jupiter. There'll be about 17 orbits like that. We've had the first one and the second one I think is coming up soon. But the last one will end on September 15th with the spacecraft actually crashing into the atmosphere of Saturn and that'll be the end of the mission. And uh, let me see what I have here. Okay, this is a little fly-along movie uh, taken on this first entry uh, through the uh, inside the rings. And it's only a distance of, a, of about 10,000 kilometers, and it's pretty gutsy. Um, we were concerned about debris being in that gap, that area between the surface of the uh, cloud tops and the innermost ring. And so we used the antenna of the spacecraft by orienting the spacecraft so that the antenna was facing the direction the spacecraft was flying. We hoped to protect the spacecraft from any debris material that was in that gap. Turns out there was none, uh, and so that was kind of an uneventful, uh, uh, I think it was a necessity and showed that we would have been safe without doing that. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about Mars, and there's a comparison of uh, Mars to Earth. Mars is uh, smaller than the Earth, larger than our moon. Its, its mass is a lot less. If you were on the surface of Mars, you would experience a gravity of four-tenths of what it is on the Earth. So anybody here is up around 200 pounds, you know, you'd weigh about uh, 80 pounds or something like that. Um, some of some people, um, my friend Edie, her, she wouldn't even register on the scale if she was on Mars. And I think a lot of people would be happy about that. But uh, here's some comparison. Uh, a lot of features in common. On the right uh, panel is Mars. Grand, they, have Mar they have huge canyons, bigger than the Grand Canyon on the Earth. Uh, volcanoes, uh, Mars has got a volcano much larger than uh, the uh, Earth's volcano, it's, you can't hardly see it. Well, there it is it there, but I think it's, uh, that, 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 the height of that volcano is off the surface is over 40,000 uh, uh, feet, so it's maybe even greater. You can see the shield from the volcano and then it's been eroded away by the action of water that flowed freely on Mars uh, billions of years ago. Uh, the geology is very similar, a uh, rocky surface, we see this from the, uh, from, the, uh, from our rovers and also going all the way back to the, uh, the Viking lander. Uh, we've had rovering vehicles on Mars, working on Mars now for since 2004, so really about four, 15 years. This was the, uh, the uh, cure, uh, this was uh, the, the ones that were launched in 2006 or something like that. That's the, uh, uh, there was two of them, uh, uh, what was it? I can't remember the name now. Curiosity, I think. What, what were the Nick Rover's names? Help me out. Where's my friend that knows the answer to the club? Rovers. rovers, yeah, the twin rovers that went down. Anyway, one of them is still working. That's, uh, that's this one here. And then uh, in 2009 or 10, we launched the Curiosity rover, which you can see trying to climb out of a, a, a pit on Mars. There's some tracks of uh, one of the rovers going across Mars. These were, these were landed with airbags, which bounce across the surface. This one was landed with rockets. And uh, there's a scene of, doesn't look too dissimilar from some places on the Earth. This is, uh, but it de definitely shows that there was water flowing on Mars at one point in time. Here is, here, here's a piece of the uh, uh, rover there, uh, Curiosity. That was the, uh, 
that was the one I was trying to think of that showed up in that previous picture, big sand dunes. So this is the next rover. This one's we're going to launch on 2020. It was supposed to be, in terms of the fundamental engineering, build to print version of what the one that's operating up there now. The thing is all different. All those, this is the science gathering equipment. Uh, on on uh, Curiosity, this consisted of some drills and some materials that capture uh, soil, bring it back uh, and dump it in a, a science analysis facility, which was located in this region. All of that's changed for the for the 2020. What 2020 is going to do is collect a bunch of samples from different locations and store them in um, special containers that will be deposited at some location to be determined in the future in a way that a future lander can come and grab that, that those samples, put them up into Mars orbit, with, uh, and, and rendezvous there with a return spacecraft that will bring those samples back to uh, Hack Earth. So this is a part of a long range range program. Basically, the mechanics of this, the method we're getting it down, is going to be the same as we used before. But all the science instruments, including something here called MOXIE, which is a, a, an experiment to demonstrate that you can generate oxygen uh, on the surface of Mars, which is important for future human uh, exploration. Uh, so what's the next step? Let's see. Okay, this little animation shows that over that, that I just uh, showed you. And what we want to do, and we're in the process of doing, is developing a uh, small helicopter that will be carried by that rover that will be capable of going out and doing a remote uh, uh, surveying, uh, taking pictures uh, of the uh, uh, areas that are maybe inaccessible to the rover, canyons and places like that, returning to the, where the rover will be, and then radioing the, the uh, content of the data that it captured in its cameras back to the rover, and then the rover will in turn relay that back to the Earth. Now, that looks pretty familiar, and a lot of the technology for this little helicopter is the same that you, we've got in these quad, ro quad, quad rovers that kids buy. I have one for my grandson. I hope you guys have one for a Christmas present, where you can actually fly this thing around the house looking at a little screen up the stairs and down the stairs. But doing on Mars re represents some special challenges because the big challenge is that the atmosphere is about one one hundred times thinner on Mars. It's equivalent to what you would run into at an altitude of about 100,000 feet. Now flying a helicopter in that, under those conditions is really, really challenging and that's a big, big problem. The other thing is that it has to, it has to be um, able to be carried, transported by the rover and, uh, whoops, that, uh, let me go back to that if I can. Oh, here we go. What do I have to do with it? <laughs> okay, that's where we were. Okay, so what I was trying to say is that there's some real difficult mechanical constraints in sewing that helicopter. I wish you could see how it works. It's kind of, have you ever seen a ladybug fly? The, the shells come out and then the wings unfold and, and uh, it's amazing uh, mechanical de uh, engineering development in, a, in, 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 the, in the insect world. We got to do the same thing here. So those are the two main challenges. The weight of it in order for it to work has got to be uh, constrained to be less than 1.8 kilograms, uh, which is another challenge. And so here is a test that we recently completed in, in, at JPO. Um, developing the, uh, the development program. There's a model of the helicopter in our 20 foot, foot uh, thermal vacuum chamber with the air pressure in that chamber reduced to what it would be on the surface of Mars. This was a major, we weren't sure we were going to get able to get this to work, but it's worked really well. And uh, we're now in the process of developing the engineering model equivalent of this. This was a breadboard a demonstration that we could actually fly it uh, stabil stabilization, too, is another issue um, under these very, very uh, thin air conditions. That was, that was a major uh, accomplishment, and that happened just within the past year. I have to wait for this to finish or I'll screw it up. It should, it should land in a second. <laughs> the, the, uh, the range of this helicopter will be on the order of 600 meters. 
can operate at a maximum altitude of maybe 10 meters off the surface, and it can fly for maybe two minutes or three minutes at a time. Well, it flies on batteries, and the solar panels on it, so it takes the 24 hours to recharge the battery, so every day you'll be able to conduct one flight. Okay, so here's, here's the idea. This is the challenge at Mars. Uh, it's going to be a race against the clock whether we get that helicopter built in time to include it. It sort of came up as a late addition to the, the uh, engineering and design of the fundamental mission. But that's where we're going. Um, it'll be a fun place. Uh, maybe you guys will be among the first people to uh, set foot on the surface of Mars. Who knows? Um, I, wish it's, I wish you luck. You wouldn't catch me doing it. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Don didn't ever have enough hours on his airplane to get me to ride with him. So anyway, thank you very much. We'd like to open up the floor to questions. Uh, if anyone has questions for Dr. Wilson. Okay. So without GPS, how will the helicopter be able to navigate and reference its position on Mars? Uh, it, it, it has a, a, well, same as the words, uh, I don't think. I think the technology is not too different from what you can buy in a, a four-bladed rotor today for a thousand bucks, you know. At this homes, it's, it's got a little inertial reference in it, and it navigates that way. There's no, uh, and no communication with the rover required for, for navigation. It's all the same technology that you're familiar with. In the back? How much wind is on the surface of Mars, or is there any? Yes, there is wind on the surface of Mars, and that's one of the problems with what that's landing there is you have, to re you have to arrange guidance systems that reduces the altitude and the horizontal and the vertical velocity to zero at the same time. That's critical. And the other thing is you want to, there's a limit to what the uh, horizontal velocity can be. And the fortunate thing is that uh, you probably saw that movie, The Martian. Uh, many, many people have seen that. And then the movie opens with a, a horrendous windstorm on Mars. Well, wind velocities can be 100 miles per hour or more, but the, you know, at that uh, pressure, the dynamic pressure is, is, is not very s significant, right? So you could never blow a tent over or anything like that. It is a problem, and we have to compensate for it. We do that. We have radars on these descent that can measure both the vertical velocity and the horizontal velocity, and the guidance system has to account for that and take the horizontal velocity out as well as the vertical. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Are you at all excited about what Jeff Cecil and Elon Musk are doing? You bet. Uh, yeah. How, how does this fit into your guys' plan? When you say your guys, I, I, I want to go back. To, uh, I, I, have, I have to be honest with you guys. I, I try to suggest to you that there's really two parts to NASA. The, the uh, human exploration uh, uh, activities and the robotic exploration activities. Us guys at JPL are all in the robotic exploration wedge of that. We have very nothing to do with the hum humans. We flown a few payloads, and actually the Galileo spacecraft was launched on the on the shuttle, which was a real problem for us. Uh, but uh, so we don't deal with. It. Now, what was your question? Okay. Well, I just wonder if it excites you some of the advancements and developments that Elon Musk and Bezos have. It's all privately. Yeah. And I just wondered if there was any synergy. I mean, it, it must claim that he's going to have mice on Mars for <laughs> four years and back and forth. Yeah. I don't hear anybody talking about this at NASA. Oh, yeah. Well, they talk about it. I think NASA is, is paranoid about it, uh, to be honest with you. I, he's demonstrating some amazing capabilities. It's, uh, and it's almost like NASA was back in the early 50s and 60s. I mean, if you go into his factory and his plant, and, you know, people are dressed almost in street clothes, not with all this white stuff, the, you know, bunny suits and what, what have you. And, you know, they, uh, uh, it's, he's taken a much more uh, direct approach. And he works with guys hard, people are enthusiastic about it. And the very fact that he's landed, you know, is vehicle vertically on the earth. You talk about horizontal velocity, 
it's a much bigger problem bringing something down horizontally on uh, vertically on the earth and dealing with the winds and uh, uh, that, and the resulting um, horizontal velocity that has to be dealt with. And his people have done that. And uh, he's launched, he's only launched over 30, I think, 34, 35 launches so far. Most of them worked. Uh, NASA is very concerned that uh, they're not going to be able to compete. And uh, so they probably shouldn't be competing. You know, I think it should be uh, private sector development. And Bezos and, and uh, Musk are, you know, sort of making that point pretty clear. I have a son that works at United Launch Alliance, if you know what that is. Uh, the two big launch vehicle providers were Boeing and Lockheed Martin. Uh, Boeing had something called, um, uh, they, they just was called a Delta at one time, and I guess it still is, and Lockheed Martin had the Atlas Agena. And uh, about 15 years ago, Lockheed Martin and Boeing got together and proposed to the Air Force, who was their major customer, a joint venture where they would both take their all of their launch vehicle business and put it into a new company, which was a joint venture called United Launch Alliance. Uh, my son had worked all his career at Lockheed Martin and its uh, predecessors, uh, Convair in San Diego and so on. And then he had announced that the SLS, Space Launch System, is uh, the new major development the NASA sponsoring, Boeing won the contract for that, and they're doing the, the, uh, the first stage. And uh, the second stage is been subcontracted to ULA, and it's going to be a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen upper stage based on the combination of those two, of the two stages that Boeing and Lockheed had independently uh, developed. And uh, that's, you know, that'll be, but they got the first version of that down at the Cape ready to go. But the Boeing with the sec with the booster stage is behind schedule, and uh, I think headquarters is worried that the way the rate at which Bezos and Elon Musk are demonstrating capability that they'll, maybe they'll figure they don't need the SLS. <laughs> you know, well, I I think they're worried that the, some people in Congress will come to that conclusion. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Musk is there every day. I mean, this guy's a, he's a brutal guy to work for. He'll fire his best friend if he's not working yeah. 18 hours yeah. a day. And yeah. He works 18 hours a day. He's a real crazy guy. He's yeah. like yeah. 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 Every four is what you get. Yeah. There was another question in the back. Oh, I was just, oh, sorry, Kelly. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, you would probably worked in the astrophysics division. Did you know a Dr. Hugh Ross? Say it again. Dr. Hugh Ross. Hugh Ross. Yeah, did you know him? I'm just I, he's not ringing the bell with okay, me. Just curious. It, was he? He worked was, at. He worked there at JPL for for a while. Well, I was there for a while, fifty-six <laughs> years. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure you. Of course, it's not a very yeah. small place. So. <laughs> well, in 1990, we had uh, the, our employment was up over seven thousand. So yeah, that would I knew be. most of them, but I don't remember Ross. Okay. <laughs> just curious. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, fast forward to outer space, they had a budget for that, uh, maybe to Proxima Centurini, our closest star, which is uh, 24 trillion miles away. Yeah. And uh, how long it would take us to get there in light years, they say is about 4.5 light years away, and there's some fusion thing that is going to go about 2% uh, of the 186,000 miles a second. So how do they feel about anything way, way out there because our fastest rocket was 157,000 miles. Helios 3 that probed the moon in 1976. <laughs> I don't think in our era we're going to get to, uh, to the nearest star. So was that a question? <laughs> <laughs> or, or, uh, <laughs> well, well you're, you're, you're correct. The closest star to our star, the sun, is over four light years away, 4.2, 4.3 years away. I don't think there's any, we haven't found any planets or anything or nearby that star. But if you could travel at the speed of light, which is not possible uh, with any technology that anybody's even been able to dream up uh, today, it would take four years. If you could go at one-tenth the speed of light, it'd take you 40 years to get to the closest star. Now, that's a pretty daunting challenge. Who would want to do that? I mean, you're going to put people in 
suspended state of animation, you know, go someplace for a hundred. There was a movie here recently where the, that was the premise of the movie. They were on a spaceship that had a thousand cargo, a people cargo, and a crew of 150. And something went, and they were, everybody was in a state of suspended animation. One guy accidentally woke up and realized what had happened and knew that he was 80 years before he got to the destination. And what was he going to do? Well, he struggled with it for a while and he did the only thing. He found somebody who looked a lot like Tracy and woke her up, you know. Are any other nations doing research of this type? Um, well, what, you, what type are you talking about? What do you mean? Uh, uh, the type you're talking about, space exploration. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, sure. I, it, India put a, or, a spacecraft in orbit at Mars three years ago, and uh, they did it for, they claim they did it for $82 million. Now, you know, the spacecraft that you're seeing up here, the rovers that are up there now in the Curiosity, those are all in the one to two billion category. So you say, how the hell can the Indians put something in orbit for $82 million when it costs us 10 times or more that much? What? They work for a dick nickel a day. There you go. Well, I mean, we graduate about, I think, 200,000 engineers a year. China graduates four, four times, or two twice as many as we do. You know, of course, the population is larger than ours, but that's an amazing, amazing statement. I'm consulting with the United Arab Emirates. They're, they've got four, they had a, have had a space program going for 12 years now. They have two spacecraft in, in the Earth orbit. Most of the hardware that's represented by those spacecraft was built for them by South Korea. They're working on a third one, which will be launched in a year or two, which uh, they're doing largely themselves with some help from uh, South Korea. And uh, just a year and a half or two years ago, which is what I'm involved in, they decided they wanted to mark the 50th anniversary of the founding of the United Arab Emirates by putting a spacecraft in orbit at Mars. That's a big leap in technology and, and capability. And, uh, They've undertaken to do that, and they they partnered with uh, LASP, uh, a organization in Boulder, Colorado, that's affiliated with the University of Colorado, and they're doing pretty darn good. Uh, whether it'll work or not, I don't know. But I can't. There's nothing I'm looking at that says it won't work. I think they're taking doing some things that we would not do, but. And I don't know what the budget is. They're pretty close to the mouth about it, but I think it's on the order of two, four hundred million dollars which would be half of what we would spend to do it, and they've got plenty of money. They have, the United Arab Emirates just announced a month ago that their 21-17 program, that's 100 years, they've got a 100-year program. What they're looking to do in 100 years is have a self-sustained city of 1,000 or 2,000 people operating on the surface of Mars. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of people thinking about it, but uh, not many countries have the money to to do it really. The Arabs do. What one last question? Yeah, question. No question about it. That this is serious scientific work, but it also looks like a lot of fun. Uh, a couple of youth up here, this young man. I'm really glad to see them here. Is there an outreach program for kids today, high school, and so forth, to? get this word across what you're saying, that they could go out there and actually play with a helicopter, or, you know, play the serious work? Yeah, there is. I mean, uh, almost, uh, I, I was going to say almost every NASA center, that may be an overstatement, but certainly JPL, certainly Goddard Space Flight Center, um, and many companies, uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, I'm not sure about what uh, Elon Musk has in that way, but most of the larger aerospace corporations have an outreach program, and, um, and um, many of the NASA centers. All you have to do is steer, steer them, put them on the website, jpl.nasa.gov, and uh, they spend hours there. There's many, many um, opportunities for students and uh, teachers and postdocs and everything else. Uh, uh, we, need, we need people as STEM education. 
I will tell you, I, I am so impressed with uh, what's going on in the United Arab Emirates. The ruler of Dubai, when I was there two years ago, made a proclamation, a decree, that every school kid had to read 50 books a year outside of the regular school curriculum. And you've got a whole program of recognition and honoring and everything. Every week you see a picture of the paper with a ruler and two or three kids that are making great progress or accomplish this or accomplish Every place you go in the city, you see signs in English and in Arabic saying, reading plus science equals success. And they are drumming it into these people. The program I work on, the project manager there, is a United Arab Emirate guy. He's a PhD aerospace engineer from the University of Virginia. There's two other PhDs that are graduates of Purdue, George Washington University. They, those, a lot of those schools have campuses in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, and where they, so they can you know, turn out people out to great. They're all well-educated, smart, and the women are totally integrated into the operation. Uh, now, I don't know what it's like in Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan, but just speaking from the United Arab Emirates, you see them everywhere. I mean, the deputy project manager is a woman. The person that's in charge of the whole science program is a woman. She's a PhD with, from the University of London or something. Right? They are so focused on, on STEM, science, technology, and engineering, and we're just barely holding ground here. Right? I mean, I, I, I think I said we graduate 200,000 engineers in this country a year, and China does twice that number. So, yeah, yeah there, there's an effect that we used to call it the Apollo program effect, which was uh, once we started the Apollo program and a big ramp up in money, it just attracted a lot of young people to go into science, engineering, and technology. And, other, and that effect has not gone unnoticed in other countries. I think that's why you see India and many of these uh, Arab countries and China and Japan going into it because they they wanted to stimulate the growth of the the um, encouragement science, technology, engineering, mathematics curriculum, and that's work it's work for the work for us for sure, and it's going to work for them. I don't know if that got to your question, but uh, yes, there's a lot of outreach, and all people have to do is get on the web and look. Thank you very much. Okay.